Turn to Psalm, if you would, and turn to Exodus 20 in your Bible. We're going to do something this morning that we don't do very often. It's actually part of, if you look in your hymn book, you'll see that there are scriptures intermingled with the songs that we sing. And those are intended to be a responsive or a unison reading of the Word of God. I See, I believe there's power in the Word of God. And there may not be much power in my words, but in the Word of God, it's quick, it's powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen? But anyway, uh, yeah, I was going to be, what was I saying before that? Man, I'm chasing so many rabbits this morning, I can't keep track of them all. So y'all pray me, pray for me so that I can preach right. Anyway, uh, God laid this message on my heart. Been, been there all week. And, uh, you know, when I sat down yesterday to start working on my messages, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have to wrestle with the Lord or anything like that. I knew what I was supposed to preach. I knew uh, what the topic was supposed to be. And uh, I hope this is encouragement to you. This still follows in along the same lines of what I've been preaching in the last couple of months. Uh, and that is uh, leaving Egypt, entering the promised land. And there's something that God did to Israel for Israel's benefit uh, that sometimes it does get overlooked. And I will say that when it comes to the Ten Commandments and this nation, why we have seen in our lifetime just how much, just how dangerous the Word of God is to lost sinners. See, lost people, they're the ones who are fighting having the Ten Commandments adorn a courtroom. Now, I've been in a few courtrooms, not for me personally. Uh, but just as, a, just as somebody watching, I've seen judges decorate their courtrooms with various things. One judge I saw, he had Thor's hammer, or a replica of Thor's hammer, uh, in his, hanging on the wall in his courtroom. Well, Thor is a pagan god. Thor is not our god. And uh, what's funny to me is, Thor's hammer is a blatantly religious symbol. It has no other purpose other than to draw your attention to the God of Thunder, who was the Nordic God Thor, son of Odin. And Odin was a God who is missing his right eye. That is the idol shepherd mentioned in the Old Testament, whose right eye is put out. Idol meaning I-D-O-L, the statue God. Because there really is no God, Odin, that is watching over the nine realms or whatever it is. And there is no Thor, son of Odin, who uses his hammer to protect planet Earth. You want to know what's protecting our Earth? The Bible says that God is our shield. Amen? He's the one with all these rocks flying around through space, these meteors. God is the one who's protected this planet from those things destroying our world. Amen? God is the one who did that. NASA didn't do it. Thor didn't do it. And you have something that is blatantly a religious symbol hanging in a courtroom. But if you go in there and just take a, a, a semblance of what looks like the Ten Commandments and write Ten Commandments on it and then have squiggly lines on it, they can't do that. Uh, who was that judge down in, what was it, Alabama? That got in trouble over it. He had a copy of the Ten Commandments hanging in his courtroom. And they threw a fit over it, and they put him out of his judgeship. And he's like, if I take this to the Supreme Court before I can walk into the Supreme Court chambers, there is a rendition of Moses holding the Ten Commandments right there on the door. So how much more, how much, you know, how much less Christian is it is in the... Uh, Boy, I am messing my words up bad. How? how forget it. <laughs> Let's read Psalm 51. The Ten Commandments are under attack. Amen? But I'm going to show you, hopefully, hopefully I'll be able to show you this morning how important they really are. Psalm 51, 
Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Zion is the church. It is the congregation of God. It's, number one, it's the congregation of Israel. Zion always represents the kingdom of God, literally here on this earth. When Jesus prayed, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's kingdom already exists in heaven. One of these days, Christ is going to return to this world. He will establish his throne in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, and he will rule and reign over this earth, literally in bodily form, with his presence being on this planet for 1,000 years. And the Bible says that we that come with him are the 10,000s of his saints that will rule and reign with him for 1,000 years. I'll be honest with you, I'm looking forward to that day. Amen? Looking forward to that day. Uh, but uh, do, good, do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Number one, a reference to heaven. Number two, a reference, let's say, to this church. To this church representing Mount Zion, the place where God dwells. Would you rather go to a church where God has written Ichabod, which means the glory of God has departed, or would you come to a church where the, you know the Spirit of God is? Sweet Holy Spirit. Melissa, I'm glad you picked that song out. I hadn't heard it in a while, and it was a blessing. Then he said, watch this now. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. So number one, who's building the walls? Who do we want to build the walls? God. Number two, why do we even need walls? Why does Jerusalem need walls? I want you to think about that. Then Psalm 119. I know it doesn't say anything about, about the walls here, but this jumped out at me this week. Psalm 119, 29. Remove from me the way of lying. Grant me thy law graciously. One thing that I know that addicts go through, that alcoholics deal with, that those who are addicted to adultery, addicted to fornication, addicted to porn, those just addicted to various things in this world, or those who have some form of issue in life that God is dealing with them about, and they want, they want God to dwell, they want God to reign, they want God to do it. One thing I know is that they hide and cover everything with lies. The Bible talks about not, make li not making lies your refuge. Uh, sometimes it is best to admit faults and move on. The Bible almost says that word for word, confessing your faults one to another. Not your sins, your faults. You don't have to get specific with it, but letting people know that you're just the same kind of sinner as they are, just maybe a different day, different time, a different way, and that there are no perfect people still in this world and there never will be until... Jesus comes and puts all the wicked stuff down and has his people reigning and living in righteousness. So remove from me, this is the cry of, of every addict, every drunk, uh, every person who is needful for God to improve their situation in life. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me thy law graciously. Now let's take our Bibles, and we, if you're already in Exodus chapter 20, I'd like for you to stand. Now if your knees won't hold up, that's fine, you can remain seated. Standing higher does not put you that much closer to heaven. Say amen. If it would, then some of us tall guys got you all beat out. Let's read this. Together, we're going to read from verse 1 all the way down to verse 17. This is the word of the Lord. This is the words written by God's own hand on two tables of stone. Verse 1, let's say it together. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. 
Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, God, for the written and spoken word of God. We thank you, God, that the word of God proceeded forth out of your lips onto two tables of stone. Moses was faithful to bring them down to us, and we have them recorded for us to this very day. Father, we can truly see it manifested the world's hatred, not of religion, but of Christianity. Not of all things that are called faith, but faith in the word of God. We see those things in this world right before our eyes, despised, rejected. And then one of these days, Father, it wouldn't surprise us if every copy of the word of God and every uh, verse of scripture would be outlawed in this world. Because we know just how much the devil hates the word of God. And Father, remind me daily and, and help me to remind these people to take your word in our hands and to read it daily. And that the devil will always try to fight us in that. He will try to keep us from the word of God. He will try to keep us away from what it says and what it does in our lives. There's power in this book. There's power in, in that two tables of stone that you sent down with Moses. There was so much glory that they could not stand to look at Moses' face. He was shining so bright. So, Father, we know that your word has glory to it. it let it be glorified in this church. Let it be glorified among all of those who call themselves a child of the living God. And forever, O oh word, Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Father, we just ask your blessings now upon this service, upon all those who hear the word of God. Father, help me in my frailties and my weakness, dear God, to speak the word of God in a way, Lord, that will send the signal home to those who need it. God, have mercy on us all, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Yes, sir. Oh no! So, uh, now your niece is your niece. Barbie? Your niece. Yeah, she Amen. Gary, we laid it in the Lord's hands, and it doesn't surprise me that this comes up. It doesn't, and I'm not saying I know what's going to happen next, 
But clearly God's doing something. Clearly he is. And uh, we, will, we will keep your niece in our prayers. Uh, God's people say amen to that. Amen. amen. Now, Israel's left bondage. They left what can be called cruel authority. Cruel authority. The only law that Israel had at that time while they were in bondage was the law of the taskmasters. They were told to do what they were told to do. They had to do what they were told to do. It, and if they didn't, they were to receive the lash or they were to be killed. It's that simple. They left cruel bondage, cruel authority, a, an authority over them that despised them and hated them to such an extent as to keep them as human slaves. I don't, I don't understand the idea of slavery. I, I mean, I don't think that way. I don't think that I have a right to go around telling people what to do without giving them some sort of credit or giving them some kind of reward or giving them some kind of payment or something like that. I just don't comprehend that. But apparently a lot, there are a lot of people in this world still today. And I believe that there are slaves in America right now. Listen, we've allowed so much illegal immigration into this country that most of those people are going under the idea that they will be put to work in America and they're going to make good income, but they're not telling them how much of their money they're going to keep back for bringing them into America. That's slavery. And they can't say anything. Anyway, let me move on. Once he got them out of Egypt and, in, and on their way, now, the question exists, what is their law? What, what, is, what is it that binds them together? What is it that keeps them together? What is it that keeps them from killing one another, from stealing from one another, from taking another man's wife or another man's daughter or anything like that? What is it that rules over them? Well, between, uh, between Goshen, where the Israelites were in Egypt, and between Mount Sinai... The only rule they had was follow Moses, follow Moses, follow Moses. But when they get on the other side uh, of the Red Sea, it's different. Pharaoh is officially gone, so there's no way they can go back and be under Pharaoh's rule again. God, watch this. Hebrews tells us that he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. That just came to me, George, that how that God had to remove Pharaoh's authority over them before he could establish his authority over them. And see, when God saved you, he did not save you so that you could go and do whatever you wanted to do and have liberty to sin all you wanted to sin. If that is your idea of Christianity, you're not right with God. Or you've been, you've been sold some poison that will keep you from serving God. The truth is different. That what God did was he took you out from under cruel authority and he put you under his authority by way of the Ten Commandments. They say, now, Pastor, what does that have to do with, with uh, walls? And what does that have to do with salvation? The Ten Commandments were uh, intended to be gates, barriers, walls, stopping points. Keep what's in, in. Keep what's out, out. That's what it's intended to be. Can you see that? Say Amen. Okay, I'm going to need a lot of help today for some reason. I don't know. I don't know if the devil's climbing all of me or what, but my mind's racing everywhere and it's hard for me to focus, but just pray for me. But the idea is we find out, first of all, when we first leave home, when we're young and we think, oh boy, I can do whatever I want to. When I left, Jerry, when I graduated Festus High School in 1984, I worked for the summer here, and then come August, I got in a car, drove 500 miles to Moore, Oklahoma, and just dared my mama to tell me something to do. One day, she got on the phone. She called me every Sunday, and there was a pay phone outside, right outside my dorm room. She called me. She's called me every Sunday morning about 7 o'clock, 7.30, something like that. And I'd talked to her a little while. Well, one time there, she kind of was getting on me. And I'd just woken up. And I'm not, I'm not good 
on my mom chewing me up one side down the other at 7.30 in the morning on Sunday morning. So after me having about as much as I could take, I finally went click and walked in my dorm room. The phone rang. <laughs> and it rang. And about the fourth ring, I said, I better answer it. Because I need money. <laughs> she said, don't you ever hang up on me. You know what I found out? I found out that when I got to college, well, it was a Christian college. They had rules. And I had to follow those rules. I didn't like some of them. I switched colleges and went to a more conservative one in Nashville, Tennessee. They had twice as many rules. Rules that to me were almost made for children and not young adults. And I really didn't like those rules. And my wife will tell you, I rebelled. They had a minimum number or, a, yeah, a, a minimum number of uh, demerits that I could get before they kicked me out. And by the time that semester was over, I was too shy of that number, getting demerits. I did. I rebelled and said, well, I'm not going to live under this. So I got married. And I've been following rules. <laughs> now listen. Now that I look back on the years of marriage, I look back on the two Bible colleges, I look back on my mom and dad. Those, those barriers, those rules were meant to protect me. To shield me to keep bad things away and to let good things happen. So turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door even Zion, Mount Zion, even New Jerusalem in heaven has a door. In fact, it's got 12 of them. That's going to come into play here in a little bit. But he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Ladies, do you, do you ever expect that uh, if a woman is out after your husband, that she's going to come to your house, knock on the door and say, uh, yeah, I have a date with your husband tonight. She's not going to do it that way, is she? He's not going to do it that way. They're going to go about it some other way. You listening? Every addiction that we have, we don't make them public. We don't go around telling everybody. We hide them. We keep them. And we never admit to them. And let me go back to that verse. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me thy law graciously. Which is better for you? To lie your way through life or to live by the rules? And the rules are God's commandments. He did not give them to us as a way to be mean to us. He gave them to us so that we could thrive, so that we could abound, so that we could live a happy life. Ask a man who's had four wives, has he been happy? No, he's not been happy. Uh, anyway, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Those things are meant to rob your blessings. They are meant to take away from what God has blessed you with, what God has given you, 
Take them away for good. Verse 2, but he that entereth in by the door is who? The shepherd of the sheep. And let me tell you, that, and I've, this is a, a thing that I've been saying now for years. Wherever there is authority, there is protection. If you were to leave the sheepfold and go outside of the walls that the shepherd made for you, what is going to happen to you? The wolves will come. And they will destroy you. They'll destroy everything that you are, everything that you have, everything that you could have been, everything that you could have had. He that entered by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name. Aren't you glad of that? Say amen. That the God of heaven, who knows the very number of the atoms of the universe, who can tell all the stars by name, who knows the number of hairs on your head, he knows your name too. Amen? Isn't that right, Sister Nancy? I tease her every Sunday morning. For a while it wasn't a tease. I kept calling her Sandy. I figured, well, we got two Bettys. Why can't we have two Sandys? It takes me a while to learn names. But Jesus knows mine. I like that. To him the porter openeth the sheep, hear his voice. He called his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. You see, if you want to go out, follow the shepherd. The shepherd will lead you out and the shepherd will take you back in. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Verse 5, and a stranger will they not follow. But will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. We had a deacon in our church down at Richwoods, Missouri. Church we pastored down there for about three years. And uh, he invited us over for dinner one Sunday afternoon. The girls were little. And uh, so we, this is before Matthew was even born. And um, we, so we went over to his house, ate dinner. And uh, then he said, come out, girls, I'll show you something. And so all of us went out there. And, and his name was Clarence, old Clarence. Uh, stood there at the gate, and he's going, suck, 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 like that. And what is he doing? And directly, here we go. Here come the cows in. So it was so cute. Lindsay and Alicia both, suck, 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 suck. <laughs> Didn't have the same effect on them, though. The stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Don't listen to the devil, amen. Don't listen to your friends, amen. Don't listen to people that's going to tell you it's okay for you to do wrong, amen. Don't listen to unwise counsel. Uh, ble blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in what? The law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Therefore he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of living water, amen. Whose fruit shall not wither, his leaf shall not wither, and fruit, uh, I can't remember the rest of it. But then anyway, verse 7, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Which means that Jesus knows who's supposed to be in and knows who's supposed to be out. And you may be sitting here today and, and have friends or family members that you're clinging to because they're not Christians, they're not saved, they get away with doing things that you cannot do, and you are around them so that you can do them. We used to have a guy that worked with us when I worked in construction, and uh, he had a drinking problem. And I had known him for years, just from going down to the same Bible camp that he did every year. And, uh, and we kind of got along because we, we were familiar with each other. And he had a drinking problem, and he told his wife that, you know, he was promising not to drink anymore. And uh, on the way home, then, if he, he knew if he rode with me on the way back to the shop that I wasn't going to stop and let him get alcohol or anything like that. And I thought, well, I'm not going to have him open up bo bottles of beer in my car and me get pulled over, and I'll get, I'll get blamed for it. 
But he wrote, he, would, he figured out he could ride with another guy named Jeff that worked with us. And Jeff told me one, one day, he said, if he wants to stop getting him a beer, what he, think, what he thinks he owes his church down there has nothing to do with me. I don't care what he does. So guess who he started riding with all the time on his way home? Not me. He would ride with the kid or the guy that they would both be drinking on the way home. They both lived down towards Park Hills, and so that became a convenience for him. See, we tend to gravitate and hang around the people that are doing the things that we want to do that are wrong so we can get by with doing them. But Jesus said, I'm the door of the sheep. All that have ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Do these walls or the gates of the sheepfold, do they have anything to do with your salvation? I'm here to tell you they have everything to do with your salvation. When you decide that you're going to live for God, I know it's tough, I know it's difficult, I know it's not easy, but it is necessary. I know that God has patience and He has a lot of it with us. But at some point, God can tell the difference between a person who's just playing along and a person who really means it. Don't you think God knows that already? Now, I'd like for you to underline these two verses. Not, not on my TV, but on your, in your Bible there. Isaiah 26 and Isaiah 60. These are your two witnesses that shows you that your salvation is built upon walls. Walls, again, are barriers. They are guidelines. They are things that keep us right with God. They are meant to keep, keep evil things out and righteous things in. There has to be, in fact, I mentioned this a while ago, when God does everything that He's going to do in this world, He's going to destroy it all, and He's going to build a new heaven and a new earth, and the old heaven and the old earth are going to pass away, there's going to be no more sea. And yet, in that new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven, guess what? There's walls around it. God is the what? Listen, this, this cry that we hear from supposedly the good Americans who are saying, we need to make America without borders. They mean for the destruction of our way of life in this country. Amen. Well, I tell you what, it gets me. It gets me to have, have people just pouring in. We, it's like we have no boundaries, no guidelines, no rules for letting people into our country. And what is it? We've already got people, enough people have shined the light of their hate in, in this deal with Israel and Hamas, who openly in our streets say, we hate the Jews, we want the Palestinians to rule. Do you think that it's only Mexicans coming into our borders? You need to think. If you think it's a good idea to just let our borders just stream wide open for anybody that wants in, they mean for the destruction of our country and our way of life. And the only way to maintain our way of life is with walls. Nancy Pelosi has walls. Joe Biden has walls. Joe Biden tells you you cannot have a semi-automatic rifle, but he's surrounded by guys day in and out, day out that have automatic, fully automatic weapons. Ain't right. In that day, Isaiah 26, 1, In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. 
We have a strong city. At one time, it was said, America, at one time, Great Britain was begging on their knees for the United States to join World War II. Not because we were weak and we would be cannon fodder, but because they knew we were a strong nation. And they knew that our little boys grew up shooting guns. And they already knew how to do it. And finally, we got involved in that war. And I, I could plainly see that had we not got involved in World War II, Great Britain would have fell to the Nazi Empire. No doubt about it. I think God did that. Amen? So we have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Those are just reinforcements and towers. And wall. You put towers along the wall so you have guys standing way up high who can see over the treetops and see the enemy coming. That You can see them almost a day away coming. And you can announce to the people, the soldiers are over there. It's going to take them a day to get over here. Everybody, you got 24 hours. Get ready. And do you think, do you think that at that time in Jerusalem, when Jerusalem was about to be invaded, that the king would say, now everybody turn in your guns, turn in your swords and turn in your spears, because really only the military should have them. Are you crazy? Hand them out, amen. Hey, give, give, you got, how many kids you got? Four? We'll give you four. You got a wife? We'll give you two more for her, Amen. Amen. Isaiah 60, verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in the land, or in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. Now look at that. That seems to be contradictory, doesn't it? If violence is not going to be heard anymore in the land, what do you need the walls for? The walls are the things that made sure that violence is no more heard in the land. Amen? Why didn't Russia send nuclear weapons over to America during the Cold War in the 60s and Kennedy's blockade of uh, Cuba? Why didn't Russia bomb us with nuclear weapons? Because we had weapons trained on them. It would have been mutually assured destruction. They saw no way that they could bomb America without getting bombed themselves. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. A rightful look at the laws of God will show you and convince you that those laws are for your own good. Let's take, the, uh, let's take the law of idolatry. Without the commandment that we shall not make any graven images, we should not pray to them, we should not bow down to them, of any kind, of anything in heaven, or anything in the earth, or anything beneath the earth, we should not make any graven images. Without that law, the Vatican would have total rule over almost all of Christianity. Because there would be nothing to stop Protestant churches, non-Catholic churches, from wanting somebody wanting to put idols and statues and, and images in their church and say, well, they're just there to remind us of St. Catherine or St. Joseph or St. Bubba or whoever, patron saint of rednecks, okay? He's got a mullet, okay? Um, we, if we need, we need a law that makes sure that we don't turn into idol worshipers. Because without it, we would. We need a law that tells us not to take the Lord's name in vain. Because if we didn't have that law, every time we mashed our thumb... Or every time we tripped, or every time one of the kids got on our nerves, we would be taking the Lord's name in vain. And God's name is holy. Amen? Without the law of God, 
Marriage would mean absolutely nothing to the people of this land. Marriage has been nearly destroyed in this country, but not totally. There are still even lost people willing to join themselves in a covenant that itself brings in boundaries and rules and guidelines. Because in the marital vows that you will keep each other only to yourself as long as you both shall live. That's always in the marital vows that I've heard. So we need laws, we need rules to keep us where we need to be. Proverbs 25. Look at this. Jot this one down. Underline this one. Everybody that has an addiction, everybody that has an issue, write this one down. Proverbs 25, 28, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. So, a person... I had an uncle, Uncle Sonny, that, I don't know, it just seemed like from the stories I heard that he was destined to live a short life, and he did. Died at, I think, 34 maybe, cirrhosis of the liver by alcohol. He had drank so much alcohol in his life that it literally destroyed his liver by the, by the time he was, I'd say before he ever made it to 35, he was dead. He had absolutely no control over his spirit. Even if, I think for a while he was a truck driver. I'm pretty sure trucking companies don't want drunks behind the wheels of their trucks but it didn't matter to him if they ever required him to not drink. He may have said, oh yeah, I, I, I can quit, I can quit. But he never did. He couldn't. And God said, he's like a city that's broken down and without walls. He had literally no barriers in his life. If there was a woman that he wanted to touch, he did it. If there was some, some wine or some alcoholic beverage somewhere, he'd drink it. If there was a pack of cigarettes, he'd smoke them. If there was vulgar things to say, he'd say them. He literally had no control or rule over the issues of his life. And God said, it's just like a city that the walls broke down. Everything, everything got into him that he did, it literally destroyed him. And he is in hell right now paying for every bit of it. Ezekiel 13, turn there. This is for, oh, let me make it like this. If you're a, if you're a father or grandfather then hear me out. Also, this is for anybody who listens to this later who is a pastor, a church leader of some kind. I'm going to move through this. Oh, my goodness. Ezekiel 13, 3, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge. The hedge and the gap, let me show it to you. Right here, look up on the screen. What good, what good does a wall do if you've got a big gaping hole in the wall? In the wall, YouTube. I had another video taken down last night. In the wall, we've got holes in the wall 
that the former president was trying to build, the current president, leaves them open. That's what it looks like. And when a pastor, a husband, a dad, a grandpa, a mom, anybody who has authority over somebody else, when you refuse to go up into the gaps and stop them, when you refuse to make up the hedges so that nothing can come in, let's just stop for a minute. And I hate to do this. And um, think, of, think of our way of life. Think of our, our homes and our church. Now, we've got a keyboard here. It's got all kinds of musical sounds on it. I can pull anything up, and we can play any kind of style of music. Uh, Matthew's on the guitar. got Dave on the drums there. And if we wanted to get wild with it, we could. Right, Dave? All right. If we wanted to just play God-forsaken music in this place, we could do it. But you see, God dealt with me on this issue years ago. Years before most of y'all even knew me. And God finally showed me, Mike, to stick with the hymn book. And I lost a friend over it. But God said, mm -mm, you're not going to do that here in this church and be the pastor. What if we had no rules in our church for what to believe? Well, then it would be like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. Everyone has a prophecy. Everybody's got a tongue. Everybody's got some kind of healing thing or whatever. And you've basically got a church that has no rules, no doctrinal guidelines, nothing. And so it, then it's up to everybody who's got some kind of oddball thing. It's going to be up to them, and they'll stand up and say, Oh, God told me this. God told me this. No, God told me this. And pretty soon, we'd be hating each other so much, just break the whole church up. So if you question why we only use one Bible here, that's why. That way you and I are reading the same rules from the same book, given the same guidelines, and everybody in here is equal. Somebody say amen. Well, let's talk about your home now. You have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge. You're trying to protect your children. Protect your children from what? Well, number one, protect your children from other children. Amen? Not every, not every kid that your kid plays with at school is a good example for them. Not every one of them. And I'll tell you what, church kids are just as easy to lead astray as anybody else is. I grew up in church, and I'm here to tell you, not many of us that grew up while I was growing up here in this church are still in church. Parents, it is up to you to fill in the gaps, to make up the hedge. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor Mike? Well, we've already mentioned kids. I can tell you a, a great problem. A cubby can probably back me up, maybe some others who have knowledge of it. And that is broken homes in Jefferson County. Where you have a, a divorce situation. And I know divorces happen. Don't take me the wrong way in this. But what happens is some woman eager to, after she's run her husband off or her husband's run off and left her, some woman then, eager to have some other man in her bed with her, just takes the first guy that comes along, and what's he going to do? He's not going to love those kids. He's not going to care about those kids. We had a situation here in this church last year where a girl, young lady going to this church, she confessed to me, that her mom's boyfriend, or her husband, or whoever he was, was molesting her every time her mom walked out the door. Every time she walked out the door. And I said, now how often does that happen? She said, she usually finds a reason to leave every day. That's what she told me. 
And I was weeping over this. Uh, you know what? Um, the mom of this girl sided with her husband. So she lost custody of her daughter. When they brought the husband up on charges and they had his trial, the jury didn't have enough evidence to find him guilty. That mother didn't care about her daughter. That mother didn't care about the gaps nor the hedges. She just let that wolf after her daughter. What about what we let our children watch? What we let them see? I have mentioned this before. I, if your children have an electronic device, you ought to have something on there that blocks stuff. Blocks it. And you say, well, my children are young. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how young your little boy is. It doesn't matter how young your daughter is. You just won't go up into the gaps and make up the hedge. Because I, for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe you think there's not any danger right now. Well, when then? When is the danger going to be there for you to take action? Just little simple things like that, people. And now, I'm not your boss, and I'm certainly not going to go to your house and start looking on your TV what you're watching. I'm not going to go to you and say, hand me your phone. I'm your pastor. I get a look at your phone. And by the way, did you know that I'm under the same rules you are? Same rules. They don't make a different set of rules for preachers and a different set of rules for the congregation. We're all the same. When I break the rules, there's consequences. When you break the rules, there's consequences. Let me hear you say amen. Uh, I'm not going to keep you much. I've still got more to go on this. I'm not going to keep you much longer. I do want you to read Ezekiel 13. And yeah, Ezekiel 13. Read the whole chapter. And we'll take this back up next Sunday morning. I think it's, a, I think it's an important issue to stop seeing God's rules for life as some burden that we have to bear. You should see them as, thank you God for putting walls of safety around me. Because even preachers need them. Even preachers do. Let's stand to our feet.